thanks, David. Thanks um, for joining me, folks. Um, and also thanks to Prince uh, Risley for, for having me this evening. Um, what I'm hoping to do, um, can everybody see my slide okay there, David? Yeah? I can see your slide, thank you. Perfect. Right. What I'm hoping to do is change the way you guys think about terrorism, if indeed you do think about terrorism. Um, and uh, what I'm going to talk about next 45 minutes or so, maybe less, is um, how information communication technologies have impacted global jihadism um, and beyond in terms of terrorism. What we basically did in this, this research, which the, it's based on, um, is we looked at the evolution of global jihadism from 9-11 onwards um, and then wanted a kind of change in understanding of, of how it um, how that's evolved you know in the academic circles but also in policy and practitioner circles so um, essentially the problem is this how do we get from 9-11 um, which is a fairly complex coordinated attack um, multiple iconic targets um, high level of training, uh, oh, training overseas mainly, um, some internally in the US, conducted by foreigners mainly with uh, visas, not actual US passport holders, um, trained in Afghanistan, or abducted and recruited in Afghanistan, financed by Al-Qaeda Central. Al-Qaeda Central is what we call uh, Bin Laden's, you know, Afghan-based uh, Al-Qaeda. Um, kills, you know, nearly 3,000 people, um, including, you know, the worst ever terrorist attack, as far as I know, in Britain, or, of British people, which is 65 dead. Um, so how do we get from, how do we get from that, you know, uh, which really announces sort of global jihadism as a strategic threat um, and induces a strategic response at least to this, which is Nice um, on Bastille Day 2016, which is a single attacker, um, who uh, is a Tunisian uh, immigrant in France, I think he had a French nationality as well, um, who jumps into a truck um, and drives it down the promenade on a busy Bastille night, um, killing, I think, 86 it was in the end. So, what you know, something profound there has, has happened in, in 15 years, if you look at it that way, you know. Because this, of course, as you guys will all be familiar, is, is really quite a, a become a stock tactic. Grab a big vehicle or a small vehicle and just ram raid, um, ram raid civilians in the city. Uh, and it's unfortunately fairly effective. Um, and so that was, the, that was the problem we wanted to try to explain. And so we went back to the, the, the literature, sort of like, what other academics talk about this? And funnily enough, you know, a lot, there's a lot of people that write about terrorism. There's a lot of people that write about typologies of terrorism, which are like these broad, basic ways of kind of helping us conceptualize them. But no one had really said, actually, you know, there's been huge technological change in the last 20 years. And sure, it's completely changed our societies. Everyone can see that, you know, how many people are walking around just glued to their phones. I see it in my lectures, you know, and um, we get addicted to the phones. It's pretty easy, too. So, you know, there's been this transformation of society in the last 20 years. It's, it's happening at a rapid pace. And then no one's actually said what's really happening in the academic literature. How is this affecting um, terrorism? Now, what I have said about terrorism is a few typologists, you know, people who've spoken about that, um, they've, they've, they've come up with a few of their own ways of simplifying the world. And a typology, if we're going to think about this, is it is a way of simplifying the world. It's a handrail, you know, it's a generalization. Not everything fits into this typology. We're not saying it's the, the be all and the end all um, of explaining terrorism. But what, hopefully what it does is like flick a switch and gives you a nice little handrail to think, oh yeah, right, that makes sense actually. Uh, and maybe you can apply it to other things in life, you know, and some people are, are, have already used this sort of the same information technology based um, uh, approach. And also what I would say is like, this doesn't mean that technology is the only deciding factor. You know, of course, there's a whole load of factors of why people become terrorists, how organizations um, uh, change their structure, et cetera, et cetera, you know, from from personal, from uh, motivational, ideological, yada, yada, yada. There's a whole load of things, but you can take a technology-centric approach and apply it, and that's what we do. Here. So typologies, what do the academics talk about? Well, they talk about the biggest one and the most famous in the whole field, and I put it in here, is uh, David Rappaport, you can see there. 
Um, and writing just after 9-11, when the whole world was reorienting itself to the threat from global terrorism, he, um, he said, well, look, let's look back historically. There's been four waves, he would argue. Um, and the first wave was the anarchist wave of the 1880s onwards. These waves aren't mutually exclusive, but they do tend to peter out, and then the next one peter out, and then the next one comes, so, um, peaks and troughs. Then you had the anti-colonial wave of terrorism in the 1920s. Uh, onwards, the new left wave in the 60s, uh, which you know a lot of us would be becoming increasingly familiar with, the Bader Meinhofs, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and then the religious wave. Of course, that was the, the the one that all the policymakers at the time of the writing of this article were really interested. It starts with the Iranian Revolution in 79, um, and what Rappaport really focuses on is ideologies. You can see all, each of those a different ideology, uh, uh, and they last 40 to 45 years. He says. Now, he does say, right, look, it's quite obvious that the information technologies at the time, so the telegram, the introduction of the telegram, spread ideas, mass new papers and railroads, you know, for spreading information are uh, important drivers. But he doesn't really go into it. He just mentions it, you know. So then we go, OK, right, what, what about global jihadism? What do people have said about jihadism and how has that changed? Um, and this is Glenn Robinson. He's a um, academic over in the Naval Postgraduate School in uh, Monterey, California. And he, he sort of took that typology very recently, took that Rappaport's typology, the influential typology, he said, what happens if we apply this to um, global jihadism? What can we see? Um, he too focuses on ideology. So he's looking at the ideologues, the main the theocratic leaders in the global jihadist movement. And he's saying, like, what are they saying? How do they envision the struggle? What do they instruct their followers to do? And he comes up with, funny enough, four waves too. Well, that's five, four. Um, and the first one is from the, uh, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, 1979, the Iranian Revolution too. Um, and it's based on Abdullah Azim's, who is a, uh, uh, an ideologue, um, view about how global jihad should be organized. And he sees jihadis as being an elite, um, well-trained, um, international cohort of jihadis who go forward and sort of um, spark the struggle. But they're to be deployed essentially against apostate regimes um, in, the, in the near enemy, you know, so against the Saudi government because they're reacting or, sorry, they're, they're allied with the, um, the US. Um, against the USSR, uh, they were the same, you know, the Mujahideen. So it's basically take the Mujahideen, this elite band that he sees them as, train them up and then deploy them over to uh, other areas, for example, Bosnia. Um, uh, and some of the African countries as well, you know, like Somalia, etc. So it was the, that was his view of, of, of global jihad and how it should be. Now that changes when uh, Azam dies, and then between '96 and 2011, Robinson argues um, uh, quite, you know, correctly in our view. Anyway, Obama, um, Osama bin Laden and the America First policy. So Osama bin Laden is a central ideologue, and America First is the is the is the change in strategy. We won't fight the apostate regimes near to us. Actually, the real enemy is the far enemy. It's America who's funding and, and cooperating with those regimes and giving them resources. So let's strike them. That's one of the big changes. Uh, the other one is he sees it in the same way as Azam is looked at, like international jihadis. Basically, uh, OBL takes that and, and makes it his own. So he sees Al Qaeda, which is known as, you know, translates as the base, the foundation. He takes Al Qaeda, but he wants him to be, again, trained in Afghanistan, this alike vanguard movement, which is going to go out and take the fight to the States, yeah, either, uh, well, mainly in the States, if you can, um, to spark a wider reaction from the States and then a wider global jihadi movement as a result of that. Um, 2003 to 2017, then you get Al-Qaeda in Iraq, AQI, and the Islamic State, ISIL. Now, their big changes, we're not waiting for, the, uh, for this American reaction and then us to big uprising for the caliphate. We were going to start it right now, and we're going to start it in Iraq, um, and we're going, to start it in, um, we're going to start it in Syria. Um, so their big changes, you know, no patience here, we are going to do it. What is it how do they could do it? Well, need a mass army to do that, don't they? They're going to need to take territory. So that's what their, um, their mentality about it is. You get Al-Qaeda Al in Iraq first, it gets pretty much disrupted for, and defeated to a degree, and then the remnants of that form, I suppose, the same group, really. Um, 
And finally, you get this other, way, other, other sort of ideologue view of um, Abu Musab al-Suri. And he, he sort of looked at, at what was happening, especially and how Al-Qaeda were kind of taken apart by the Americans and defeated initially. And he said, actually, what we really need to do is this, this is about personal jihad. That each individual has the, um, the, uh, the duty to take up, you know, essentially jihad, but against the oppressors. Uh, of mainly Western states in this case, um, and and the the cumulative effect of numerous small jihadis individuals, the lone actor, what they call them, um, doing attacks, uh, will have a large uh, impact on on sort of global politics, global security. So the idea is smaller attacks everywhere, you know. So that's how Glenn Robinson sort of says, right? That's how jihadism has changed. But again, and, and ideologically, he's looking at right. What? Who are the big thinkers here? What were they saying? You know, what was going on? Um, he says he identifies as well. He says, like, okay, with Al Suri, clearly, you know, if you're going to be motivating personal um, jihadis, you got to be communicating to them personally. Um, and he realizes the internet really is a key enabler of this. But he doesn't really then go back and say, like, what about information communication technologies in in the in the sort of first year, first wave, second wave, third wave. And so what we did is we sort of looked at it and went, right, we need we need to do this, but we need to do it in depth and apply it to each of these. Uh, each of these sort of evolutions um, and see what we come up with. Um, and so what you've got, I'm just going to try and admit here, there we go. Oh, that's good. So that's sort of context uh, I, I've painted there, the problem, um, hopefully, and then the, uh, the literature, about, you know, what, what other people have talked about. What I want to do then focus on is, right, what did we come up with? First thing you've got to explain, and you guys probably are well aware of this, you know, it's just a rapid, um, explosion the exponential growth in information digital information communication technology since basically 2000 um a quick definition of terrorism is generally seen as a tactic for the deliberation for the deliberate creation and exploitation of fear through violence or the threat of violence in the pursuit of political change um and a lot of people have talked about globalization and terrorism and you know terrorism is globalization is both a driver of um of terrorism and terrorism can be a, a reaction uh, to it jihadism especially you know but in terms of icts what do we start to see well you start to see around um the 1980s onwards you know increasingly portable video cameras yeah and then in the 90s increasingly portable satellite tv uh, links you know so those those tv vans which can really go anywhere um, even into you know sort of more remote areas of Afghanistan by the by the nineties as well, um, and then you get the internet, which becomes you know starting to in, uh, become um, increasingly used by civilians in the nineties. And what we call this is like this: the internet when it was first around, and, and I'm sure you guys remember it. I do, you know, mid nineties. It was um, it was fairly static. You know, you looked at a web page, you could you could click on a few things, but there wasn't that much you could do. It's like basically reading a book. <clears throat> excuse me, reading a book um, uh, on a web page, often a pretty poor one. Mm. And that was, that was the, the, what was known as Web 1.0, dominated the 90s. What you got to see around 2000 onwards, you know, is this, uh, what's known as Web 2.0, much more interactive, user-friendly websites. You can click on the menus, you can draw things up, you can sometimes watch videos, that comes a little bit later. Um, but it's much more user friendly, easy to navigate, um, and and interactive. Yeah. Uh, and what comes with that, with the with Web 2.0, of course, is the growth of social media sites. Because once you can start to interact, then Facebook suddenly, right, bang, 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 messages, videos, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, uh, Twitter. Um, these are all examples of Web 2.0 platforms. You know, and you can see that see there Steve Jobs two two thousand seven. This starts to all come together. So you get YouTube ish, you know, becoming more popular two thousand and three onwards. Uh, Facebook launches two thousand and seven, I think, if I remember correctly, or maybe two thousand and five. Um, you get all these major apps starting to 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 launch around then, and then of course the iPhone, which comes along and it puts it all in your hand. Um, there's a thirteen fold in uh, processing computer processing power between 1999 and 2013. Um, internet subscriptions, you know, look at that, mobile internet subscriptions, two billion in 2013, six billion in 2018. I think it's something near seven billion um, 
around about now. Now the thing about the iPhones you got to remember is it's basically gives you the similar audio visual editing capabilities to a studio, right? On a portable user friendly device, the size of your hand linked to the global internet in real time. Yeah. Like it's completely in the terms of history of, the, of, of, uh, humanity. This is utterly game changing. Yeah. As, as some sociologists have said, the impact is basically similar to the invention of the alphabet. That's how much it's going to change things. And of course it is rapidly. So those are the sort of, download on right ICTs and global change and youth and growth um, who are we where do we come from um, so you've heard about myself uh, this is one of the major um, major in you know actually the, the guy who kind of came up and was thinking about this and then I said to him you should we should write an article about this this is Michael Chertoff you might remember him he was the first no, was the second um, secretary of the Department of Homeland Security in the United States the DHS was set up uh, in response to 9-11 and the idea was listen we need to integrate all these government agencies we have much better because you know the, those terrorists were able to get through all the gaps we need to get them together so he brought together a lot of not this so much the intelligence agencies but customs border coast guard and um, all this kind of thing were integrated into um, infrastructure protection into his his new agency and um, he's a fascinating character because he he uh, He's a lawyer by trade. He actually brought down the mob, um, John Gotti in the New York Mafia. He, he was the one responsible for leading that investigation. So brought down the mob in the States, especially New York, um, and, uh, and wrote the Patriot Act, which reforms uh, U US laws in the wake of 9-11, of, of, uh, sort of closed the gaps there legally as well. So he was sort of the, he's got all the, the practitioner experience is coming from a, a place of real deep knowledge um, and having gone through this whole this whole period basically a lot of it in charge of a massive organization so um, it was built on his experience and then Daniela Riktorova is my uh, friend of mine from um, King's University and she's a researcher especially in sort of uh, Cold War history so she was able to do all the bits about um, global terrorism 1.0 and what was going on there so that's sort of the team and the experience that we came came with and what did we come up with well, basically what we did is we looked at you know looked at information communication technologies how put them for forefront how did that mean how did that make um how did that make uh distinctive patterns of organization amongst global global jihadists um so i've mentioned you know 9-11, coordinated mass casualty suicide attacks against iconic targets for maximum dramatic effects. You know, there's a lot going on there, right? These are like the biggest terrorist attacks you can do. You could say Madrid, 2004, killed a lot of people as well. That was another one. Um, uh, and to a degree, uh, to a degree, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't actually say that. Not. You can see just the impact there. And what did it need? Needed long-term planning, and you're talking years, um, overseas trained operators, operatives, and a support network um, for them to conduct. So to do that kind of attack, Al-Qaeda Central, like Bin Laden's Al-Qaeda, was very hierarchical, micromanagerial, uh, and highly bureaucratic organizational structure. So, you know, what we know now is that actually after the raid, which killed um, Bin Laden 10 years ago now, um, the, they found out like the, the, the Al Qaeda Center kept like copious notes on all their members, and when you wanted to join them, you had to fill out a uh, application form and list your hobbies, for example. Um, and uh, it basically was Al Qaeda Central represented the kind of old bureaucracy sort of government government ministry um, in the in in the nineties. You know, it was it was that kind of bureaucratic organisation. Uh, it relied on a lot of the time they relied on couriers, so they didn't even use phones. Uh, they relied on couriers, uh, or they would use satellite phones. They thought they were more secure. And how did OBL communicate with his followers? Well, he used high profile newspapers and TV interviews mainly. And he'd spend three hours talking on the finer points of theology, which, you know, not many people would watch, uh, hence why his vanguard was quite small. Um, but, you know, and propaganda would be disseminated on video cassettes and later DVDs. So you can see there just by how they communicate, how they're organized, it's very much, you know, a, a, um, a, a 20th century basically, um, organization. 
Um, and it slowly evolves because, you know, in response to 9-11, you obviously have the US, they go into Afghanistan and drive Al-Qaeda out, the Taliban out as well very quickly. Um, and as I mentioned with Michael Chertoff getting, you know, all of the US, you know, it was the strongest power in the world at the time, but the hegemonic US government getting all of its assets together and, and becoming much more integrated and closing those gaps, which meant that, you know, Al-Qaeda Central and this sort of overseas, you know, recruits traveling over to, to Pakistan or Afghanistan could be intercepted. They could be watched and um, they could be there. They could have their, their signals intercepted. The, um, their ability to get back into the States, especially could be closed off. That's why they bring in a lot of the passenger name, record data, et cetera, et cetera, tighten security at airports. Um, so that there's a, there's an evolution going on and then they have to respond to that. And one of the things, because the, the center leader like OBL and uh, Zawahiri were under so much pressure, they couldn't really move so that, and they couldn't really communicate. So, um, because they'd get caught. So this, um, forces an adaptation of, of Al Qaeda, but essentially what you see is, if, if you look at what technologies they were using, you, it mirrors the, and it's a way of looking at how their organization was as well. Um, slowly evolves under pressure. So you guys may remember the 2006 liquid bomb pot, was, which is a plot which is equaling the size of 9-11. Um, of Luckily it was foiled and it's, it's the reason why everybody has to still get their, their liquids in small bottles checked because it was gonna blow up 12 transatlantic airliners. Um, pretty much simultaneously um, uh, and luckily it was foiled. So that was, was still directed by Al-Qaeda Central you know, um, to, a, to a large degree. So that's sort of 1.0. 2.0 then um, is, uh, yeah, you've got um, Abu Musab al-Zakari there. You probably remember him from, from the time the Iraq war was going on, um, a very brutal and dangerous um, leader of al-Qaeda in Iraq, the leader, initial leader of al-Qaeda in Iraq. 2.0 is, is very different. And it sort of realizes that actually we don't need these iconic mass casualty suicide attacks um, on, on uh, iconic buildings in the West, you know, that actually we can smaller coordinated attacks can have a global impact. Um, and there's a good few examples of these in, from earlier days. Um, it's a result of basically Al Qaeda Central, as I mentioned, being degraded, and so other organisations, other jihadi organisations, with links to Al Qaeda, but not able to communicate, you know, in that sort of um, coordinated, long-term fashion with, the, with with essentially OBL, and um, they fill that space. Uh, um, so the distrib the, the, they're organised a much more flexible, distri distributed organisation. Um, and as I mentioned, limited communication with Al Qaeda Central. And what's interesting is, with, with, with as I said, with global jihadism one, you you basically were radicalized over a slow time, mainly through people you knew, what you read, uh, and often at the mosque. And then you traveled to Pakistan, and Afghanistan, where you got your training, and then you were sent on your mission, you know, or you came back and then you were sent on your mission. What happens is you get much more a mixture uh, of the radicalization and training happening at home and not so much, or, and abroad, but the home element starts to come into it. This training and communication at home back in the West, yeah. So you see this sort of slight change going on. It's difficult for them now to travel to Iraq, much more difficult. They're gonna get, um, you're gonna get. Um, what does it result in? Well, it results in, there's still collective attacks. There's still groups of people attacking. They're still fairly well planned, but um, often not in this sort of like years of, of planning, like 9-11 was. Um, and there are marauding attacks. So this is when you see, you know, like Mumbai, where you had groups of, um, of LET terrorists, basically, taking, you know, trying to stretch the response teams as much as they can, attack different things in a city, soft targets. Um, not iconic buildings as much, soft targets, and they, the teams just keep fighting and fighting and fighting, stretching the response teams all over the city until, until, they're, um, until they're killed. Um, they're assisted by advances in mobile telecommunications and Web 2.0. And so, like, and a really interesting example of this is, you probably don't know, like, but it, in Mumbai in, in the 2008 attacks, they attacked the um, Ober, Oberai Hotel and the Trident Hotel. And uh, the security services were basically caught 
badly off guard and, and it took them a long time to respond. And so you had a lot of people hiding in these five star hotels and only a few, you know, four or five terrorists sort of holding out, holding onto the whole, um, the whole hotel. But what they were doing is they were being, first of all, instructed in real time over, um, over the internet, basically like WhatsApp, an earlier version of WhatsApp, from a handler in Pakistan telling them what to do, who was just watching news reports and telling them, right, go here, go here. Or that, that response team is coming for you now from here. Uh, you need to move. Very precise instructions and stuff. The second one, which is, is interesting as well, is these attackers were looking at Facebook updates and Twitter updates and, um, and then targeting people from their updates. So like Facebook, I'm stuck in this hotel. I'm stuck in this wing. I need to get out. Help, help, help. Well, there you guys. So suddenly you get this sort of operationalization of the internet for, for uh, actually influencing how terrorist attacks and also the response because Mumbai is, guess what? It's a, it's a big cyber hub in India. And a lot of people were posting information which was useful to the um, response teams and the emergency services and also to help civilians like stay away from here don't do this and, and building a picture, you know, the Wikipedia page on the, um, on the Mumbai attacker was like a post-mortem terrorism investigation done, you know, pretty much within a couple of days afterwards, just because everybody entered all the information they had and were able to corroborate it. So, so you get things changing massively. But one of the other big things about 2.0 is that, you, you know, if you're going to recruit people and radicalize them at home, well, guess what? You can talk to them using web. 2.0 um, and Zarqawi realized this massively unlike unlike OBL with his three three hour monologues on the finer points of theology he would just send he send camera teams ready to to follow the suicide bombers and the bombs that which were blown up the American um, army uh, you know as they were struggling in Iraq the roadside bombs etc and then he post them on YouTube YouTube you know which allowed you to then comment on them and share um, and of course, it was such a good way of, 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 of spreading propaganda. You'd have also people looking at, you know, who's signing in and commenting and trying to, to get a hook in there and, and recruit them initially. Um, and it was a great source of financing that and Facebook, you know, um, you could collect donations. So, um, yeah, there's a big change. And also what you saw is distributed, um, flexible organization, Al-Qaeda under, central under pressure. So now that they um, that they don't have to rely so much on um, on I've got someone joining here. I think oh, let's see. No, I don't think so. Um, uh, yeah. So the, this sort of more networked organizational flow uh, enables franchises like Al Qaeda in Iraq, Iraq, like Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, um, etc., to sort of pledge allegiance, but be more loosely. And connected to the central organization and what we argue is look without web 2.0 this would be absolutely impossible yeah without web 2.0 there would have been no jihadism uh, 2.0 um and sort of the most refined in, in you know if you call it that the most refined example of these attacks are are, are um seen then later on in in france really in paris 2015 where you get you know, highly trained, well, fairly well trained, but experienced um, ISIL soldiers, you know, who have come from France and Belgium, spent some time fighting in Iraq and Syria, come back, know what they're at, get some training as well, link up with other members who are less experienced. So you've got sort of guys who've been away and, and you can imagine like experienced soldiers and then less experienced guys who just know them or met them online back in Belgium and France, and and they, they link up and they conduct really quite um, sophisticated attacks uh, on numerous targets in on soft targets in Paris. <coughs> and like again, one of the really interesting things about this is that they were, you know, they use the um, they use the their victims' mobile phones to communicate so that they couldn't be uh, intercepted while they were going on through their attacks and, and used encryption as well. Um, so you just get this sort of sophistication, more sophistication of the, of the more auditing attack. Now 3.0, um, much looking at towards the individual, the lone actor. Now there's a lot of debate about lone actors. They're not actually on their own. Everyone, we're all social animals. We all have a social media, you know, nearly absolutely everybody. So. Um, the family would know, you know, this is always the thing or may have known or friends or whatever. So lone actor, 
and there's often you know also when you actually really forensically go through their communication there's often a handler you know or somebody guiding them on it's just more difficult to find generally is sort of is seen to look at like uh, a lack of any assistance from the central terrorist organization which is a crucial so like al-qaeda central absolutely no no clue about this you know often isil have less of a clue which is one person um, or two people, you know, um, completely online. So impossible without the web. Um, social media, really important. And encrypted apps, you know, like Tor and Telegram, which were very popular with, um, with jihadis uh, because they thought that they could speak to each other, um, you know, freely. Uh, um, as I said, radicalization and training also only happen in online. Now, if you only train online, you don't actually get practical experience. Guess what? Not that good at doing what you're going to do you're not going to be able to build a bomb that well um so the theory goes anyway and, and so the practice goes too so you ended up with much cruder tactics and that means you know suddenly isil are saying to the to the jihadis at home in the west are saying pick up a you just got to pick up a knife you got to get in the car get a truck you know do anything and um, so it's much cruder because you can't train them because if you train them you're going to get it's directed again soft targets but this soft target is like anywhere it could be like you know um a, a park in reading or it could be a uh, a pharmacy you know it just it's it, it could really be anywhere or a bridge you know as we've seen as well so it's sort of this idea anywhere and everywhere we we, we can attack um now there's a, the ramification of that is actually that has a sort of from the terrorist perspective, it has a quite an increased psychological impact on societies because suddenly, especially when they're happening, you're thinking, no, this could happen anywhere, really. Where, where is safe um, within, you know, sort of, especially within cities, et cetera. Um, and they're also difficult to stop because, you know, as they say in sort of counterterrorism, when we come on to this, you know, there's not much of a signal. If someone, if you just decide you're sitting there watching videos and the videos are being monitored or not, and then, uh, and then you decide, yeah, I'm, I'm going to read that magazine. It says go and pick up a knife. Um, they're just difficult to stop. There's not much of a, of a signal there for the uh, services to, to pick up. And also you start to get this, um, this crossover where actually mental health issues become more important because Lahaj Bruhel, who was the, the terrorist attacker in, in Nice, you know, he, he had a long, significant history of fairly, um, fairly serious mental health issues, um, and had li lived a sort of unbridled life um, before he turned very quickly to to G to you know. So he was radicalized very quickly, actually. Um, and this idea of redemptive G had you actually start to see this in 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 two point zero later iterations and three point zero of of young men who'd actually been quite separated from their um, their Muslim faith and and acted, you know, what they would have obviously internally viewed as as a sort of against it, like a Westerner, you know, drinking, going to strip clubs, etc. You know, some of the Brussels attackers were literally in uh, ran a bar, you know, about six months before they were involved in the attack. So, and that's a totally different process from uh 1.0 where it was a radicalization very slow and then oh he went to be more radicalized more trained you know these guys are what they call the flash to bang much faster now and um, and often for a redemptive jihad and and so you end up with these sort of the um the 3.0 attacks uh, and this example is london bridge it, it shows a sort of marauding attack there were a few of them but they weren't well trained it was very crude weapons um, Etc. And you can you can look at the the latest one. I think of us with the Westminster Bridge um, attack. Um, and there's a lot of them that go on like this now. They, they started in about 2014 in France um, with tour, um, uh, but they happen like all across Europe and, and sort of continue to uh, happen. That would be terrorism 3.0, basically all internet um, and all based about the internet. Um, 4.0 is is sort of where it's going. Um, and the future, uh, and and this is something you know that Michael Chertoff was kind of looking at um, and thinking about, and he he provided a lot of this. It's basically, um, look, we've seen this. It's going, you know, the the, the shutdown, um, the shutdown of the U.S. plant. It was, it was international terrorism, or you could say, it was state-sponsored international terrorism. The hackers, you know, shutting down the U.S. Um, oil company there recently. The attack on the Irish uh, NHS. Uh, a couple of days ago you know it's going that way anyway which is the, the use of the internet as an operational tool 
media. So the attack happens through the internet. Um, related to, to this, you know, 4.0 can related, be related to 2.0, 3.0 and coexist with it. We're not saying that one ends and the other one doesn't, like, um, like Rappaport. These o overlap, coexist, um, because it's, they're driven by technology which is available. Um, so um, we're going to use the jihadi example here. Uh, 2015 and 2016, the uh, Islamic State set up two, you know, hacking uh, cyber capable units, um, which you can see there, ISHD and UCC. Um, some of the sort of more low scale stuff that those hackers were able to do, they took over the Twitter accounts of US CENTCOM and Newsweek magazine for a while. Um, much more seriously, the UCC published kill lists with instructions to assassinate US government and military personnel. Um, you can see them there. What, what they're kind of ba fairly basic. Um, well, it's obviously to do with early coding. Um, their, their logo look like. Um, and in 2015, the ISHD published its own kill list of 1,400 um, mostly US personnel. Um, and again, telling people to, these are them, uh, if you know them, go and attack them. It created a fairly serious security concern, as you can imagine, especially for those identified. And the counterpoint to this, right? 2015, US Cyber Command and the NSA are able to hack ISIL's communications, get into their WhatsApp group, and start targeting. And there's a lot of stuff you can do once once you you get into that. Um, and of course, ISIL are on the battlefield, having their commanders taken out, or, um, and think there's a spy you know, um, or, or a number of spies. They're trying to work out how is, it, how is it being penetrated. So that's the use of like communication devices, uh, you know, and the internet um, uh, 4.0 and sort of the operational practice using it to, to, to attack both sides. And you can just see there the, what the UCC sort of um, organized themselves as, very much based around this sort of uh, dystopian vision. So I've talked and I have touched on the evolving responses to all this, like and how, how how things have changed. Um, you can see here, I mentioned this, like 1.0, that bureaucratic, highly uh, centralized, the top decision maker, you know, sends out his orders. It takes a long time, a lot of planning, um, overseas training, et cetera, et cetera, uh, based on analog, early, very early digital communications. Um, all that created, you know, a loud signal, yeah, for the security services. Um, and they could target it, you know, they can, as they did, they would, right, what's our strategy? Well, protect and pursue, essentially. That's the U.S. after 9-11. Protect the U.S. and all our security architecture that we need to get in order and our intelligence and uh, pursue, pursue them abroad, you know, and that, that was the reason for, certainly for uh, Afghanistan. Um and so you can target with the operations. You can also those operations and using your signals intelligence or SIGINT, you can, they will, they will force up lots of chatter. You can collect that chatter and guess what? You can start to reveal more and remote, more and more uh, uh, communications and then uh, and the sort of hierarchy of, of how the uh, organization is working. Um, and what you start to see as well is part of that pursue piece is right. We need to get all these agencies have previously been, you know, high in the U S highly competitive, um, what they call the beltway wars. They don't really want to work with each other as turf wars. Um, and that hasn't got them to, you know, it's, it's led to, to nine 11. So we need to get people together and this integration and fusion cells, everyone's sitting around in the same, same space, got access to the same, well, their own databases, but they, they sit beside the next guy uh, who's from the FBI, et cetera. And that builds slowly tr trust different working routines and, and you get to into more, much more integrated picture and eventually integrated databases. So, so that's how you kind of, in a very broad brushstroke, I haven't gone into much, much detail ever, like that's how they deal with this AQC threat. Of course, you also went after the financing, which is something I haven't met because, because you could see and you could much easier to map the flows of that kind of uh, financing organization, certain, um, streams from Saudi Arabia, et cetera, et cetera, going through, you, you target the financing too. Um, 2.0, what you need to do, it, it was happening with, with 1.0 towards the end of it. Um, 2.0, you see much more increased international intelligence liaison. Um, one of the things about marauding attacks, you need much more rapid and professional response teams. You know, there's, you know, there's not going to be any negotiations with these terrorists a, a la the IRA, and um, you're going to have to use lethal force. Um, 
they're starting to target stadiums, uh, as we saw in um, in the Stade de France attack that kicked off the Paris attacks. Um, and you're going to need uh, more protective measures at large public gatherings, not just iconic buildings like the Houses of the Parliament that came in after after 9-11. And also a focus on the UK is really good at this generally, you know, community policing, getting into the communities and, and understanding who's going on, oh, is that, that chap going on the wrong path, do we need to get him off, how can we help, how can we engage, etc. Um, looking at it from a vulnerable uh, vulnerable person kind of perspective uh, as long as they haven't committed a crime yet you know uh, and some countries have been good at that like the UK um, are better at it and some countries have been poor at it like Belgium and, and that, you know certain districts like Molenbeek where a lot of the Brussels attackers came from the US again needs to start and has recognised it needs to start doing this better um, 3.0 uh, how do you deal with that well of course this is all in the ether it's all on the internet so suddenly it becomes like agencies like you can see there GCHQ who vastly um, in the 2000s increased their capacity to collect metadata. Metadata, you're probably aware, is, is basically every signal, every email, every phone call would have a time, date, location, stamp, duration, basically. Uh, so without, and so they can check, collect all that math, metadata, search it using well AI at the moment, you know, data mining techniques. Um, and then they have, they'll have like programs which will say what they think is within the paradigm of a threat and, and threat areas. And then if they need to, in, you know, read your, or listen to your call or read your email, etc., then they have to get a warrant. You know, they haven't go before a judge. But that's how you. So you collect, you sample, you prioritize, uh, you rinse and repeat. You know, and you keep doing that every day. You know, so um, that's how you get around. That's, that's sort of what you get. And obviously, there's, there's websites you're targeting and content you're targeting and. There's, there's a big debate about whether you leave stuff up because it's actually good as a honeypot and then you can you know, get leads, etc. cetera. Um, but also to help in all this, you need, as I mentioned, human intelligence, community policing. So actually human intelligence is, is also useful for 3.0 because again, it's help might give you that lead. Oh, that person's got, he mightn't have been on your, on your um, metadata sort of uh, radar, etc. cetera. Um, and increased uh, in protection of public, public spaces in general which is hard hard enough to do you're being spread very thin um what's the reaction to 4.0 4.0 really is is basically with sort of the national policy level really increasing critical national infrastructure cyber protection um left to left to organizations and this, the national cyber center say in the uk which would be um showing business businesses, for instance, but also individuals, I suppose, how to um, increase their cyber protection um, and a greater awareness um, of um, public uh, public awareness of how cyber terrorism could could uh, evolve. And one thing, you know, we can all do less personal data um, on social media profiles, which is that's just putting it out there. Um, so that's kind of how how also CT counterterrorism has evolved over, over the, the time. Now we would argue, you know, we've used global jihadism here as a, as a case study, but we would argue actually, if you look at it, this, if you put technology central, this actually explains a lot of change in, in a lot of organizations. You know, we, we mentioned at the end of our article, you can look at the new IRA, they're doing a similar, um, they've changed in a similar way. And there's other, other organizations out there, including like the far right, definitely you can see as a sort of, 2.0, 3.0, um, these kind of attacks, you know, and how those, they, they're, they're driven by the changes in, in how people can communicate and upload and recruit and retrain, etc. So there's this, I'll see if I can click out of this now, hold on. This table, um, this is sort of a broad overview of, let's see, what I was talking about. Um, It's not going to let me shimmy down. No, it's not. Okay. Well, look, the table. The table's in the article. It's also uh, if we go online. So it basically just divides them down. Each of each of the um, each of the each of the here is.
each of the years by training, finance, etc. Et makes it very clear. Um, so anyway, it'll go up on there. Okay, um, that's it, folks. I uh, hope that was um, at least informative and hopefully interesting. Um, if you want, you can, the article is free, um, free to access, and um, free to access. And um, I'm I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. If um, if David, you could uh, open the the floor. Yes, I will do that. I've got a number of questions here. What I'm going to do first of all, though, is um, take back the... Take back and show. Right, I've reclaimed the host. Yeah. Um, and um, what I intend to do is to um, stop the sharing. I, I mean, what what one thing that people need to recognize is that um this talk will be going up on our virtual brlsi uh, website in a few weeks so if you think oh i'd really like to look at that article you will be able to find the talk and go and pick up this um website link uh, but if you if you need it I suggest you copy it down now because I'm going to close down the screen and so everybody can see each other again very shortly. Okay, so can you, Patrick, close down the screen share on your machine? Uh, In the top there, I think. Yep, yeah, done. There we go. So thank you for your very interesting talk. Um, it's it's not something I ever thought about. The if you like the analysis uh, that you've done of the different kinds of terrorism, of uh, when you go through them, the different the transformations uh, are obvious, kind of in a way. But it's not something that I've ever thought about before. So that was really helpful. So what I'm going to start off doing is uh, going through a couple of three questions that have um, appeared on the, um, um, ah, before I do anything else, what I'm going to um, uh, go to the last comment, which is from Anne Berrier, which says, could you please copy and paste the link to your um, paper into the chat? Yeah. So people can, Copy it out of out of the uh, out of the chat room. That would be really useful, Patrick. I tell you what, it, it's the simplest way for anyone to do this, right? The link will just come up if you go into Google and put in "bytes not waves." That it'll doesn't. Come up, it? It'll right. come up straight away, and you can read it for free if you just it's open access. Yeah. Bytes not waves. Okay, and that's the bytes not waves. It's the first thing. I love this talk. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, thank you, everybody, who's sent in some questions. I'm going to uh, start picking up on these. If you've, if anything crops up and anybody else wants to add any uh, comments, questions, please do so. So, first of all, uh, again from Anne Berrier. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, Anna. Um, what is your assessment of the government's, I suppose that means HMG's, prevent effort aimed at identifying young people at risk of radicalization in the UK? Yeah, it's a very good question. It's not my, like obviously as a, um, as an academic where it's impacted in universities, uh, it's been something discussed. I'm aware of the debate. I haven't seen, um, certainly at the University of Bath or heard of any like direct, um, direct issues with this and also so to me it's 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 not actually impacted me personally um and i think academics in general would be less likely to actually uh although they do you know have a responsibility i think they'd also be quite critical and um certainly my feeling of my colleagues quite critical and don't like being sort of asked to snoop um with you know as part of this and it's been very controversial um 
Nevertheless, I'd also say that this, you know, if we all have a duty of care to, first of all, vulnerable individuals if they're being brought down a path which they shouldn't be, um, and secondly, to the collective society that you know that if something dangerous is going to happen, you should, you should do it and you know it. The problem is you often don't know it, isn't it? Um, for me, really, and the way I look at it is, I, I, I personally view these as vulnerable people, you know, and they are on a ramp, which can either be a steep, fast ramp or a slow ramp, as, as I've said, to um, potentially to committing a, a, you know, a criminal act, a serious criminal act. If you can get them off the ramp in a safe way as soon as possible, that's what you're trying to do. Um, and whoever is the right person to engage, it, you know, is... is um, it, you know, is the best person to engage. You know what I mean? Like, is that often university lecturers or teachers? Or oh, I don't know. You know, it's one of the two thousand and five bombers uh, who blew himself up. You know, signed off before the attack uh, with his name, but Bin Laden. You know, and had made outlandish, absolutely outlandish statements in front of the whole class that he was going to kill people. You know, like should that have been reported? One hundred percent. You know. Um, Anna, do you have any comments that you'd like to make? Um, simply, I'm asking because a couple of years ago I had to undergo training as part of um, my uh, teaching commitments at a, a private school here in, in Bath. And I was, it was interesting and it made me think about a lot of things, but I did wonder to what extent they were barking up the wrong tree because we were being asked to look for evidence among our students. And, and I thought that unless you were really very close to a particular student, you would probably not notice any, any difference. Um, I, I, I took it seriously, but I have to say I've never ever had any reason to fall on my training to spot anything. Mm. That's all. Yeah, very interesting. I, I haven't even had the training. You know, they haven't come around to the universities. Um, and this, this is the difference you see because the university will be an adult. Yeah. You know, you are dealing with, with, with children, so it's... it's Adolescents, yeah. Yes, it's, it's, it's much more... Um, well, I suppose it's important that they get it. But, I, it, you know, I think a lot... that Definitely a prevent in general, you know, is, is criticised for over-securitising a problem, certainly with certain communities, you know, felt, uh, alienated them at the start, got better as it went on because they realised, Jesus, we're not we're doing it right. It's all mm. about trust. It's all about relationships. Um, and I think, you know, generally, off-ramps, this idea of off-ramps, it comes from organised crime, it comes from criminal gangs, you know, basically. You're trying to get the third sector in there, but anyone who can get a hook into the individual and say, come on, you're going the wrong way. Um, that approach seems to work better than um, than treating if you get them early enough, you know. And also, the one of the really things that often isn't tried is like there should be if someone is engaged uh, and your family thinks you may be engaged in terrorism, there should be a very big um, concession made at a criminal case if it's gone that far. Do you know what I mean? So there's a, a quid pro quo that the fact yes, you you have done that person a favour by by um by giving them up because that's another thing that's going on people are like okay it's going on but jesus this guy could go down for 20 years like so um that's another okay. element to it. true thank you thank you i've got a question from penny law uh the typology that you have developed appears to underestimate or ignore perhaps the roles of women playing jeopardizing western security interests and therefore may cede a strategic advantage to terrorist organizations. Do women terrorists confirm to the typologies? So the typology is, no, it's an interesting question, but no, this is, this is about organization. So it's, it's not, we're not really talking about gender. You know, this is about how, 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 how information communications technologies enable organizational solutions. Uh, yes, but my, my question was, do women conform to the same behavioral patterns as men with their organizational technologies? Uh, oof, that's a good question. Um, you know, women jihadis, I think, uh, well, there's obviously there's some different elements. So like if you look at, and the really interesting one has been that we know have a fair bit of evidence about is recruitment, women recruits to ISIL um, in Syria and Iraq. Uh, the answer is 
they are hooked in a different way um, often, you know, and the hook is off, uh, you know, the same motive I defending, um, doing your duty and defending the caliphate, um, doing the right thing. They're often alienated by Western society, same as males. But um, what you find is that um, they're promised a partner. The females are promised a partner out there, a jihadi um, fighter who they would then marry and, and potentially have children with. Um, and that, that does happen. So there's that narrative too, which is different. Um, so certainly with recruitment, yes, there's a different, different, and there's different roles. Obviously, they perform when they get there. You know, they're not, they're not in the terms, they're not seen as, and they weren't seen as, as, as uh, cannon fodder. They're often used as. If you look at Sally Jones, who is the the former punk rocker who was recruited uh, from the UK and, and married a fairly senior um, ISIL operative. Uh, she was put to work doing propaganda. Um, so uh, yeah, it, look, it, it, it depends. There's certainly different narratives, but it, the point about it is ICT 2.0, 3.0 enables that for man or for woman. It doesn't make any difference. You know, that's that would be the organisational thing. Okay, thank you. Um, from Rhys Miller, has your research actually been implemented by practitioners in any form? Um, it's a good question. It was basically come from practitioners. So, I mean, it's the, the practitioners are the people who instigated your work and have been funding it and have been. Using no, not that way. It, just in terms of, so it was Michael who said when we were we were we were Michael Chertoff, who was sort of the head of one of these organisations for a long time and stays very close to the sort of topic. He was like, um, the way, this is the way I see it. And I see it as like 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, 4.0. And I was like, Phew, that's amazing. That's really clear. And then when, and then I was like, you could tie that. He, he saw that one. I said, but you need to tie that with technological change um, and make sure that it completely aligns. And he was like, yeah, okay. But then let's do the research and, and, and crack on. So it actually came from practitioners um, and certainly, you know, and based on their experience. Uh, in the States especially. But let's say in the UK, so do GCHQ and uh, MI6 think in these ways these days? Well, they would see it as completely evolving. You know, I can't, can't speak for either of those at all, but th they would certainly notice the difference. They would see the evolution of plots. Mm -hmm. yeah? And so the big wake up call for, for six and GCHQ was uh, for the UK was you know, 2005, these guys have passports. They're British, you know, they're British nationals. We were looking at like Saudis and Yemenis and, 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 and Somalis as the, as, the, as, the, as the risk. And they're going to train abroad and they're going to fly to Pakistan, Afghanistan. Suddenly, whoa, these guys are, how many people fly to Pakistan from the UK every day? You know, that was the game changer for them. Um, one of them, one of them, you know, and then you got three. So that they'd be completely aware of like, oh God, it's, it's all moved online, you know. Whether they've read our article, I don't know. It's got a good few reads. But, <laughs> but you know, the point about a typology is it just puts a little bit of clarity. It helps you order your thoughts. That's do it. You think, do you think that the terrorist organizations, uh, and of course, as you said at the end, you know, you've used jihadism as, a, as an example here, a mm. useful example, but clearly there are uh, state terrorists, there are other terrorist groups uh, that are developing. Do you think that they are using the same sort of um, breakdown and thinking, what have we got to do to, to get to 5.0? Well, what would this is, yeah, five point, I don't know what 5.0 would be. Maybe the sort of weaponization of terrorist AI, um, which would take so that you'd be analyzing cyber threats using AI. I don't know. Um, I think what happens is this is an iterative, you know, symbiotic game of evolution uh, and counter evolution. You do this, they do that. You do this, they do that. Everyone's feeling their way in the dark. Yeah. Um, and that's what happens. And, and so it's been. You know, they started off as hierarchical, bureaucratic, um, based in Afghanistan, long term. And guess what? You know, once the U.S. and the rest of the West basically got its house in order, 
uh, and went after them, they could take them down um, and degrade them fairly quickly. So guess what happens then? Okay, Al Qaeda in Iraq, more networks, less hierarchical. Use the internet. We're going to, you know, what can we do? What can't we do? What are the what are, what are the um, changes in society and technology which are enabling us to 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 change the way we do things? It's just, it's just, you know, and these are competent guys. So, you know, it's it's thought about carefully and then it's tested. Okay. I noticed that Anna has very helpfully pasted the link into the chat. So anybody can pick that up if they want. Uh, we've got a, another question from uh, Rhys Miller. Uh, you mentioned community policing. How would you approach this in relation to counter-terrorism? Do you believe that local police forces do enough in this respect? Um, if not, how could they improve? Uh, admittedly, a bit outside what you've been talking about, but obviously you've got experience of this general no, so Yeah, com community policing is about, first of all, you need enough police, yeah, which has been cut drastically, so that doesn't bode very well. Secondly, you need a police, a, an ethos where the community, and you know, this, the UK has been pretty good with this generally, you know, where the, the, the police traditionally are respected by communities, that the bobby would be expected to know a certain individuals, certainly leaders, community leaders, that the police chief would know his patch, um, that there's visibility, that there's trust, that there's liaison, you know? Um, and especially when you get into minority communities, you know, um, that this is important. And so that's what I mean by community policing. Um, and of course, there's another element too. I talked about fusion cells, like about where you need to get like your intelligence all together. Well, actually it's okay. So, you know, we can, we can, talk about in the UK, right, we think of intelligence, we think of six, we think of five, we think of GCHQ, but guess what? Like, they're not going to solve all the problems because you need border, you need customs, you need um, finance, you need the treasury, you know? So the amount of people you need around the table, actually, if you're going to fuse information, and then, then you're going to need, um, you know, uh, what do you call it? Social services. You know, some of these places, it's going to be, you know, unfortunately, that, that you know, the reality of terrorism, it's, it's people in deprived areas to a degree, not massive, you know, not totally, but it, that can help. Um, charities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Suddenly, that, that is what we're talking about. Like, it's, and it's not surveillance. It's about sort of, a, again, if you take the vulnerable people approach, it's about trying to identify vulnerable people and get them, get them off that ramp sooner. So two things. A, 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 you know, a face-up community policing approach by people standing there and knowing their communities. And secondly, an integration of knowledge and information that is available in the community. I mean, what, what it sounds to me like is that you're talking about a, a UK homeland security a bit. Um, it's a homeland, the Department of Homeland Security slight is different. This is about... Because the Department of Homeland Security, as it is, um, basically was about sort of increasing protection and integration of agencies, right, themselves, right? The in let's put them all under one branch. It, let let's think of like 1.0, like in one way, like 1.0, 2.0. It was like, look, we need to get them into one, one head and make one head because they're all so disparate. It's all over the place, right? So they did that organizationally. What I'm talking about here with the UK is the integration of information. Well, so you're not necessarily, you're not necessarily, yeah, you're not necessarily taking, um, you'll have one social service, for example, right? Let's yeah. talk about Scotland. Scotland has a devolved administration. They have a system called SMART, Strategic Multi-Agency Response Team. They have, I think, 34 agencies involved. Yeah. And that isn't, that's just them sending one rep, basically, to the place where they have one big room where, you know, a whole load of offices where all the different agencies can interact with each other. And he still sit he or she still sits there with their, their database on their computer. You know, they want to share it. They have to get approval, but guess what? You can have conversations. Ah, can you just check that for me? Yeah, I can. Yeah, of course. Grant. Yeah, no, nothing there. Okay. Yeah. Forget that. And that doesn't know. work the same way in England. Yeah. Similarly, I don't know about the, how many agencies around the table. So what you get is it's it's about it's about trying to close the gaps on information so that things aren't missed. You know, look at nine eleven. There's so much missed. You know, as you guys probably well know from from getting on a flight and saying I don't need to take a don't flight simulator. I don't know how to need to know how to land the plane. 
Yes, that will go down in infamy. Uh, yeah. Has done. Has done. Uh, another question from Anna. Uh, in view of the obvious shift towards cyber threats, whether by Islamic or other terrorists or criminals bringing down essential services through hacking, what's your view of the continued emphasis on the nuclear deterrent in our country and in others? This is almost a kind of personal comment here, I suppose. Uh, yeah, well, um, it's an interesting one. I don't know about nukes, but like, okay, so like the Russians basically are, are using, you know, they're very good hackers. R- R- Russia, like the UK and the US has, has very good hackers to, to, to counter this stuff and, and, and prod them back. But the, um, the Russians have very good hackers and uh, you can, you know, like the stuff that happened with the Irish Health Service there in the last couple of days, which I've been reading about, you know, it's I'm, I'm pretty sure it's it's a Russian criminal group that's been yeah. trained by the, you know, um, tra- trained by the Russian cyber specialists, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it's very ha- handy, isn't it, to have cyber groups that are criminals that are targeting your adversaries and are unattributable to you. Um, so the question then really is about deterrence. Can you deter cyber attacks with straight, with with force? And so far, you know, no one's been ready to. Um, to the West, especially, you know, where they'll be communicating back channels, they'll be doing stuff in cyberspace, hitting them back. You can better, you better believe it. But um, so far, no one said, you know what? If you take down our NHS, we're going to bomb you, you know? And we don't care if it's unattributable, you know? We're just going to do it so you stop it because we think you control it. Now, that's a huge difference, isn't it? I'm not talking about nukes, so I wouldn't go there. But imagine if you said to China, oh, you just stole our secrets from um, Babcock, you know? Uh, we're gonna we're gonna um, shoot down a uh, one of your uh, military aircraft, or something like the next time it goes over. Do you know what I mean? So that's where the potential for escalation is. So far, the rules are you don't do that. You only escalate in cyberspace, and no one's crossed that. I wouldn't be too worried about someone going, oh, you cyber, even a really terrible cyber attack on Wall Street, which you know maybe shut down the economy for four or five days. It will be Ill- very hard to attribute it if someone does that. I would have thought, and. Um, I don't think anyone's going to go right now, now with incomplete information that I'm going to nuke X country. No, but I I suppose uh, suppose the question, the the, the thing is that, you know, back in the 1950s, 60s, the the big threat, you know, five to 11, two minutes or midnight, five minutes to midnight, two minutes to midnight. It was all about nuclear attack. Yeah. And maybe I've exactly. Yeah. Um, Maybe I've slightly misunderstood the nub of the question. Does it make it obsolete? Does cyber make uh, the nuclear arsenal obsolete? Well, actually, um, there's an interesting question that you might want to think about at the same time, um, because I don't know if this is a question or a comment from Pete L, who says, uh, current nuclear deterrent can't be hacked, or a nuclear deterrent can't be hacked. So, you know, is this a threat to us as well? Oh, I, I, like, I don't have the clearances to talk about that with any kind of <laughs> No. <laughs> to be honest with you, I, like, I, know that, I know that the computer systems for the US uh, RSL were aging, you know, 10 years ago, five years ago. They're trying to spend a lot of money now. To, it was basically done on still on floppy disk because that's when they had in the 60s, you know. Well, that um, makes it. That makes I, it uncorrupted. Yeah, it's, on floppy it's patched, you know, but, it, but it's patched. Like, so you got these, and they're trying to upgrade it. Of course they are, you know. Um, and if that's the case with the US <laughs> Arsenal, imagine what the Russian Arsenal is like. So, um, you know, they had no money for 30 years, as far as I remember, you know, yeah, for about that 20 years anyway. Um, so, uh, I don't know, but I, you know, I don't have the, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to speak about yeah, that with yeah. any sort of authority. Anyway, I, I, can, I can comment that for you, David. Yeah, the reason it can't be hacked is because it's still analog. So uh, our deterrent at the moment is still on an analog system. So uh, uh, the new yeah. system that they're bringing online will be digital. So that, yeah. There you go, yeah. Yeah. It can't be because it's such a, so old, um, uh, it can't be broken into. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, that, that's often handy, isn't it? You know, really handy. It's perverted, um, yes. Yeah. Um, Patrick, I, I'm just looking around the room, the virtual room, just to see if there are any more questions. I haven't got any more questions. Oh, in the, in the inbox. Oh, here's one. Hello, yes. Uh, 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 can, can, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I just wondering about um, uh, when nine eleven happened. I mean, there'd already been warnings: the attack on the USS Cole, the attack on the American embassy in, in Kenya. But suddenly, everyone was looking at this thing called Islam. Mm. Islam. Where's Islam? Mm. And then suddenly, there were words like 
Sunni and Shia were being talked about. Yeah. Um, and the Iranian the revolution. Laughism. Where exactly does, does that fit in? Um, and, and up until then, you know, Arabs were people who did nasty things in relation to Israel. And, and, and then suddenly every, every, everything changed. And um, it's it, it a bit like COVID. There's sort of um, new strains <laughs> constantly being developed. Well, like, like global jihadism, the roots of global jihadism emerges out of Egyptian prisons, you know. Um, and oh, I've forgotten the name. The, the guy who wrote... Um, a little fella, yes. <laughs> no, and I've forgotten his name. Anyway, it emerges, you know, there's, there's a crackdown again because basically jihadists, Salafists are a threat in, um, in, we're in Egypt in the 60s and uh, we're put in, in prison. Oh, he's got a book, it's called like The Past to something. And... Um, Curry, Curry, I know, I can't remember. Anyway, he's a huge influence. He writes a book, and then it's a huge influence on OBL, essentially. Um, so that's the sort of the, the re I realize roots and interpretation, which, which, and you know, when you get to ISIL, I've read around it's like the, the way that ISIL interpret the Quran and the Hadith is just wrong. You know, it's just wrong, and they're just picking stuff out out of context and stuff. So How about Al Zumar? Hmm. How about Al Zumar? Al Zima, is that it? I don't know. It doesn't, doesn't ring. He was, he was one of them. Katub. Katub. Oh, Katub, yeah. Katub is the one. He's the one who starts it up. So, um, so it emerges out of that. But, the, but yes, like in the way, like it's an interesting thing. Like, look at like two strategic, like you could say, the two strategic shocks. Um, with Al Qaeda in the States, there was a cell tracking them. It was like small in terms of the CIA, massive cutbacks after. Um, the, you know, the end of the Cold War basically laid loads of people off. Um, programs not really reinvested into to sort of switch from looking at the Soviet order of battle in, in Eastern Germany to picking up people, you know, um, uh, individuals who are using sat phones and stuff. Now, it, you reordered them fairly quickly. So, but basically, if you talk to people in the States, they would say like on a few days after 9-11 when the intel people were getting around most people were like in the pentagon you know who were back in work were going like how do i spell al-qaeda what is it you know no like no, i didn't have a clue i was only 20 like or so but like you know no, no one had a clue this is a threat um only only small um certain cells working on it um did so you know that's what i say so the roots the roots go long um and the reason they came as a surprise was that, yes, there were a number of warnings, um, but they tried to hit um, bin Laden with cruise missiles. And they missed them. Uh, and uh, probably one, like one of the critiques is they didn't do enough at the time. Another critique is, guess what? The information wasn't joined up enough. So, yeah. I have a last question. Okay. Um, which um, has come from Rhys Miller. What plans do you have for upcoming research in the areas of counterterrorism? Um, Terror I um, mean, counterterrorism is presumably. Kept yeah, I'm looking at a new sociological way of understanding um, how how so counterterrorism in intelligence is very goes to the heart of the state. It's often seen as like sort of a sovereign power, and um, obviously huge legislative differences even between closely allied states like the US and the UK about what you can and can't do, what's admissible in court in terms of, so you end up with really the, 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 the research, the current research says there's a lot of stuff that's different. You know, you, you got to judge each country by its own. And yet I think if you look at 9-11 and if you look at uh, what's changed in international transatlantic counterterrorism since 9-11, actually there's a whole lot of obvious and similar organizational solutions. So that's what I'm working on. Patrick, thank you very much for a very interesting talk and for a good Q&A session. Thank you, everybody who's asked questions. It's always very valuable to have that. There's a round of applause going, I've noticed, around the room. So thank you very much. You it was a pleasure. And, and thanks so much for your questions. They're really good. It's, it's really interesting to, be, um, to have that kind of conversation with a, with a civilian audience. I'm, I'm really impressed. OK. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Um, Cheers, guys. So, Bye, folks. Take care. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night.